morning, everyone. We're going to get started in a minute or two. We're going to allow people to log on, and then we'll jump right into our education series event this morning. So if you'll just be patient with us for a couple of seconds, then we'll get started. Welcome to the Missouri Public Transit Association's educational series. Today, we will be looking at transit and human trafficking. According to the US DOT, as many as 24.9 million men, women, and children are held against their will and trafficked into forced labor and prostitution. And transit can be a huge conveyance for traffickers in our communities. We know this topic is more important than ever and are happy to welcome our special guest speakers today from the Covering House. First, I'd like to welcome the MPTA board members who are here with us this morning. We are in a webinar format, so you won't be able to see faces except from our uh, panel and our speakers, but we wanna thank you for your leadership on public transit and thank you for joining us this morning. Second, I'd like to thank Marcy Maestricht, who is the Corridor and Long Range Planning Coordinator with East West Gateway, which is a member of the Missouri Public Transit Association, as well as a Covering House Board member. I'd like to help her for, thank you, Marcy, for helping to organize this. And I just wanted to give you a couple minutes to say a few words why you thought this program would be so important in Missouri. Sure, thank you, Kim. And thank you so much for having us today. Um, you know, I've been a transportation planner for over 25 years at both the state and regional level. And I learned about the covering house more than a decade ago when it was still in its early development phase. It wasn't quite operational yet. It was still kind of a dream of its founder. And since then in my non-work life, I've crossed paths with the covering house over and over until finally this past year, I made a commitment to do what I can do to support its mission. And I became a member of the board of directors. Um, one way I think I can support its mission is through increasing awareness about trafficking in the transportation community. Um, the Covering House has a, a really cool partnership with a Missouri American Water Company. Um, they work with them to raise awareness about trafficking, generate support, and just to help staff recognize the signs of trafficking when they're out in the community doing their job. And I, I believe we could, could cultivate similar relationships and partnerships with transportation agencies and transportation decision makers. Um, there's an obvious link, just like you said, Kim, between trafficking and transportation. Like any business, human trafficking depends on transportation systems to operate. Um, traffickers may recruit their victims from bus or train stations. They utilize transportation systems both to bring their victims to trafficking operations and transport current victims to different places where they'll be trafficked and abused. Access to transportation or lack of it is also a key obstacle for many survivors trying to leave a trafficking situation. I was telling a coworker the other day that we were doing this session and he had shared with me that he shared with his wife that we were doing this. And she said, why are we talking about this in Missouri? Is that even an issue here? Um, so I just wanna share some statistics with you. According to World Population Review, Missouri is ranked eighth in the nation regarding um, or ranking the states with the highest human trafficking rates. Um, and those are reported cases per capita, um, eighth. So if you're thinking the Midwest isn't a trafficking area, I, you're incorrect, it is. I mean, think, things are happening here that you probably don't even wanna think about. Um, Kansas is ranked 15th, Iowa is ranked 17th. Um, so it's happening here in the Midwest at rates that are higher than or similar to either coast. One of the big factors in its ability to thrive here in the Midwest is a robust transportation system, which we have. Um, so I, I'm certainly not the expert on trafficking here, but we are fortunate to have two people with us today who are. They are true crusaders and working to help raise awareness about trafficking 
and to help survivors heal and thrive. So I'm gonna give it back to Kim who will introduce our speakers today. Thanks. Thank you, Marcy. And thank you to East West Gateway. And thank you for bringing this critical connection between human trafficking and transit to the forefront of this conversation. We really appreciate your help, Marcy. So now I'd, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers who are the experts on this subject. We are lucky enough to have with us today, Sharita Allen, who is the executive director of The Covering House. She has over 24 years experience working in social services. She has a wealth of experience ranging from direct care in residential facilities, foster care, case management, and individual group and family therapy. Sharita provided consultation and training with the Missouri Children's Division in Sex Trafficking Victim Response Training and in Missouri and Illinois in needs assessment and strategic planning related to sex trafficking. She has exclusively counseled survivors of sex trafficking since 2014. Thank you, Sharita, for joining us this morning. We also have with us Jessica Wilkins, is the Administrator of Community-Based Services at The Covering House, where she is tasked with building, implementing, and overseeing programs to raise awareness of commercial sexual exploitation of children and reducing the risk of kids falling into trafficking through community engagement. She has provided education and general knowledge of commercial sexual exploitation to students, parents, and staff all over Missouri and even in Pensacola, Florida. So we're gonna leave time at the end for questions for this. So please place your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. And right now I'm gonna turn this over to Sharita and Jessica for them to begin their presentation. Thank you again and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'm Sharita Allen. Um, as Kim just said, I am the executive director of The Covering House, and it's a, a pleasure to be able to educate and share what we have learned um, throughout the years about uh, sex trafficking and how it's affecting um, specifically our area. Um, I'm going to get the PowerPoint up and get started. Um, so just to mention one of the things that Marcy talked about, we've actually moved up. If we're eighth now, we started at like 20 when I um, began my volunteering um, with the Covering House back in 2012. And then we heard more statistics when we were 13 for us to be number eight now. That's um, pretty scary. Um, I know one of the other big factors, not only with transportation is a big issue, but we also are surrounded is a trivia um, thing for you. If you ever in a, a trivia game, you can win with this question um, that we are surrounded, um, Missouri is surrounded by eight states. We have eight states that touch us. Um, so we, um, uh, Tennessee, that Memphis area is also a pretty big area that we get a lot of um, trafficking from or they um, go through, um, through the boot hill of Missouri to get to Memphis. Um, so we, um, you know, Tennessee is one of the states that we touch and we have um, a lot of people who run to Missouri um, because we have a lot of rural areas that they can hide in. Um, so we, we just are almost a perfect storm for, um, for it to be for the, the reason that we are high in, um, in that, that exploitation realm. So we'll get started. This is our trafficking one-on-one. So just a little bit about the covering house. So our mission is to provide refuge and restoration using the least restrictive environment for sexually exploited and trafficked children and teens, providing safety, dignity, and freedom, utilizing top level staffing and oversight. Um, one of our great things that we like to um, say is that we do um, safety, dignity, and freedom, not only for our clients, but for our supporters, our donors, our volunteers, and our staff. Um, we have a residential facility with five beds currently, and we are in the process of renovating um, a second campus that will have um, 16 beds to be able to provide more care um, and 17 acres where we can build to be able to um, increase those beds because unfortunately, like even at this time, we have nine referrals right now um, fighting for one bed um, in our facility. So the need is, is really great. Um, we operate a resource-rich facility providing trauma and survivor-informed care specific to sexually exploited and trafficked children and teens within Missouri. Um, we also provide individualized and group 
community education tre treatment via our community-based service program, which Jessica runs. Um, we have launched a prevention program known as Reducing the Risk, which um, even presentations like this is a part of so that we can make sure that um, the, the community knows that it's happening and it's not just happening um, everywhere but here. So wanted to reduce the risk and help everyone to pay attention so that we can uh, reduce those risk factors that make children vulnerable to trafficking. So when you first think about what comes to mind when you hear sex trafficking, um, there's so many things that, um, that come into mind. A lot of people, first thing I usually hear is, well, that movie Taken, um, where Liam Neeson um, rescues his daughter. And then it goes into, I think it's like three or four now that he's made <laughs> more movies with. But um, while that, while yes, that is an example of trafficking, that's not necessarily how it happens here in Missouri or St. Louis. Um, you also hear about prostitution. Um, you, when you um, hear about kid, uh, people being on the stroll or the strip, you'll hear them talk about that or um, you have more of the, the common language that you'll hear is uh, sex slavery. So that, you'll, that you think of those people who are tied or chained and, um, and make it made to have sex. Um, and definitely money is always involved. So exchanging sex for um, money. So those are the common things that we hear um, when we first ask people, what do you think about trafficking? Um, so the federal definition for sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purposes of commercial sex act, for a commercial sex act, excuse me, in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. Um, that's really key with the with the work that we do. Um, so any trafficking, any sex that is um, exchanged for money, um, a child who's under 18 years of age is automatically sex trafficking. Um, when we think about human trafficking in general, there's, we never want to forget labor trafficking because it all, it often intersects with it, intersects with um, sex trafficking. Sometimes um, they're just forced to work and then other times um, they're forced to work and they're made to do sexual acts. So labor trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, pinage, debt, debt bondage, or slavery. So what we have here is um, just another way, a more visual way of understanding that long federal definition because it's just a bunch of words <laughs> at times. And so this here just gives a little breakdown of that, that definition. So under acts, we have what, what is actually being done. There's recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, um, and the receiving of the persons that are going to be trafficked. Um, the means, what, me, what actually happened? Um, threat or use of force, coercion, abduction, fraud. How did, basically, how did they end up getting this individual? Um, and then the purpose, they got this individual by some means, some way, in order to do this certain task. So um, prostitution, sexual exploitation, forced labor, slavery, similar practices, removal of organs, or other types of exploitation. So you'll hear often um, the word CSEC. Um, hear people who have been um, working in the anti-trafficking movement talk about CSEC. So CSEC is commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, and there's two forms. We have that indirect form or that direct form. Um, so a direct form is what we often hear, what uh, more people are familiar with. So that's sex work. Um, the actual, you know, being on the stroll, what they, they categorize as prostitution. By the way, there is no such thing as a child prostitute. Um, if it's if they're under 18, if they are a child, it is they are not a prostitute, they are being trafficked. Um, 
So we also see that in survival sex for food or shelter or clothing or a ride or medicine so or even drugs sometimes. Um, but in, we also have the indirect uh, C-sex, which looks like stripping or the pornography, webcamming, escorting, um, sexting. Um, or that sex exploitation now that they talk about where um, a kid, um, because of some kind of sexting, they have pictures or videos of them um, naked or performing a sex act that is now being put out on the internet or being um, spread through the schools or um, threatened to be given to their family. Um, and a lot of times that indirect, uh, that indirect um, exploitation is is what get the get that child used to um, and get them prepared and ready for that direct. So if you're already stripping, you're used to showing your body. If pornography is a thing, or you're, um, you may already be having sexual acts, um, webcamming. Um, people think that webcamming um, is harmless because they're in a separate room. So you have that webcamming, but they're, again, they're getting them used to showing their body or getting them used to talking about that sexual act with sexting. So it gets, usually gets them prepared, ready, and opens that door to be able um, to start looking at that sex work or, you know, uh, using, this is what I can get to do um, to get some food or shelter for that survival sex. So what is exploitation? We're talking about sex trafficking and exploitation. So exploitation, the act of treating someone unfairly in order to benefit from their work or making use of and benefiting from their resources. Um, we teach our kiddos um, that we work with that um, not all traffic, uh, not all sex is um, trafficking, but all trafficking is exploitation. Um, and when we explain it as like, here's um, exploitation and what it looks like, you get more of our kids who identify as like, oh, oh yeah, well, yeah, I did that, but I'm not trafficked. It's really hard to um, get them to actually um, see themselves as a victim of trafficking. But when we talk about exploitation, it does open up a whole new level to have that conversation with them um, with, with things like survival sex. Like, have you ever, you know, uh, given someone a ride, uh, just for a ride, you need a ride somewhere, or you needed some place to stay because you ran away and you knew that you had to sleep with um, whoever was in the house or the main person in the house in order to stay there. And that's they're like, oh, well, yeah, I know that, but, and then you, uh, you were able to open up that conversation to talk about what exploitation is, and then once something is exchanged for it, to talk about what trafficking is. Other common terms that are used um, for, for it, we'll hear commercial sex exploitation, domestic minor of sex trafficking, um, sex slavery, and modern day slavery, which are some of the terms that are really common right now. So I want to give you a few examples of what, you know, what you may hear. So how would you define this? We just defined human trafficking or sex trafficking, and we just defined exploitation. So a single mom came home early from work. She was met with two teenage boys running out from, running out her front door. And they appeared to be pulling up their pants. Her daughter's defense is to shut down. After a few hours, it becomes clear something sexual happened against the daughter's will. Law enforcement was called. The boys said it was consensual and the, sh and the case was dropped. So based off of that information, I'm not sure if there's enough to really determine if it's exploitation or trafficking. It's definitely a little uncomfortable. Um, so Let's say the young lady is 14, the young men are 16 and 18. Um, this happens in May, maybe. So it happens in this situation happens in May. Um, mom continues to, you know, ask for help. Like something has happened to my child. Clearly she's shutting down, she's getting quiet, she's not responding. Um, and so um I guess when school starts back up in August, she is really kind of acting out in school. Um, but she had always kind of been one of those kids that acts out in school. So 
there was no need to really get involved. Um, Mom is continuing to ask for help, especially at the school. Um, And because she was considered a troublemaker, they kind of just blew her off. Um, It wasn't until the end of first semester um, where school decides to express some concern as her grades have tanked. They went from A's and B's to D's and F's, and she's no longer showing any interest in any of her activities um, that she previously um, participated in. Um, They send her to have some conversation with with a therapist, um, and something still isn't coming out. So there's, um, they're continuing to bring more people to the table, trying to understand what's going on. Um, and it gets to a point where it's disclosed that um, her boyfriend is using her to settle his debts on the streets with with drug dealers. So he has a drug habit that he cannot afford. And so he tells dealers he can go get whatever kind of payment they need to get from his girlfriend. Um, does that that takes it to exploitation as there's an exchange of drugs for sex. So again, it's oh, the, it's the commercial piece, the exchange of um, some kind of sexual act or something that brings sexual gratification for something else. Um, and like Sharita was saying, it isn't necessarily always tangible. Um, sometimes it's a place to stay, um, a shower, or maybe even protection. I want to mention in that last one that once um, once the boyfriend, because the boyfriend is the outside source, it, um, it is now trafficking because he is controlling it um, for it. So it's exploitation and trafficking in that situation. So we have a second one. How would you define this? Amanda is 22 years old, is a 22 year old teacher who began a sexual relationship with a 17 year old student. The relationship is consensual when asked by both parties, although the 17 year old also states, I love being with her. She buys me whatever I want. Um, Want to mention that the age of consent in Missouri is 17. So how would you necessarily define this? So this unfortunately is seen quite often. We're seeing more and more movies and shows and things like that kind of touch on situations like this. Um, And with that being said, um, again, like Sharita mentioned, the age of consent in Missouri specifically is 17. So it's not necessarily illegal, but the issue comes in um, with this idea that there is a power struggle. It's someone that has some power and authority, um, potentially, excuse me, potentially um, kind of flexing this relationship, this sexual relationship over someone that um, has less power and has less authority, um, which is why this is something that would probably be unethical, um, definitely can be considered exploitation because of that power struggle and the fact that they mentioned that she buys me whatever I want. For me, as someone who um, has been working in anti-trafficking work now for a while, that would be something that makes me think, okay, we need to do a little bit more digging and get an understanding of um, what the nature of this relationship really is. So for this particular situation, it's definitely at least exploitation because it it might not necessarily be the fact that they're buying them things, but it's the exploitation as there's a power differential. These are some examples in popular culture of that kind of power differential and how sex is used in in those ways. Um, We have a real life example (laughs) of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, as well as uh, several shows that are marketed towards preteens and teenagers. And so this idea of dating and having sex with the popular older person or the, the older person that has a lot of power um, with the intent to sometimes gain things from that. Um, it's becoming very common for them. It's talking to some of the kids that we have talked to it's been the whole, well, 
um, it's it's cooler to to date somebody that's older than you. And again, we're seeing these shows that are marketed to them that's telling them that that's okay. Um, things like Pretty Little Liars, um, that exact example that we just went through, that's what Pretty Little Liars had. It had a teacher, um, a young teacher and a high school student in a relationship. And unfortunately at the end of that series, they get married. And so those are the kinds of things that are perpetuating um, these images and these connotations about relationships to youth. That ro um, and that romantic relationship is what draws um, our young people to to relationships like that. That fantasy um, about you know this passionate relationship. Um, so when we start talking about how we see it happening here in um, domestic situations, you will see more of those um, romance terms gone bad. But um, if that whole idea that a bad boy um, loves me and will do all of this for me and he protects me, I'll do anything for him, even if that means I have to sell my body. Another scenario. So D is 12 years old. She has been in constant communication with older men, engaging in erotic conversations via text and social media. She and one man in particular have expressed such deep love for each other, they have decided it's time to meet. In this situation, this situation, they do. They meet and um, unfortunately, this is actually a real situation that we encountered and they were able, the police were able to, um, to intercede um, and get to um, her before he did. Um, so he was because he was already um, on the radar for picking up another, um, I think she, this other young lady was 13. So um, they were able to pick him up. So this is, this particular one is a clear, um, a clear picture of, of would have been trafficking, but um, this is what we call the sexploitation. Um, Cause she sent videos, they, um, pictures they had um, and planned to meet. So he was actually crossing state lines to get her. Last scenario. So Penny went to a junior high party. While there, the other kids paid several of the girls to strip or do rainbow in the back room. If you're not familiar what a rainbow ring is, a rainbow ring is a different colored lipstick used to make um, a rainbow on, um, on a penis during oral sex. So that is definitely trafficking. There's the exchange of a sexual act for money. Um, but of course we had to understand what rainbow rings were before being able to determine that. Um, and that is something that came up from some of the youth that we have talked to. They informed us of what rainbow rings are. Um, the biggest thing that I like to think about regarding this scenario is if they're in junior high, they're anywhere between the ages of 11 and 13, typically. Um, and so the other piece that tends to get people um, really confused when it comes to whether it's trafficking or exploitation and things like that. Um, if they, be, they be, people believe that because the kids are in the same age range, that it's not trafficking. It does not matter how old the individual is. Um, there have been um, minors charged with trafficking for sure. So human trafficking is big business. Um, how much money is generated from human trafficking annually? Unfortunately, a lot. Um, to be honest, these are kind of um, outdated, um, but I still like to use them because it shows a couple of things. One, these numbers are astronomical. They are very large sums of money on top of the fact that we struggle to pinpoint when it comes to statistics around trafficking sometimes because it's still such a hidden underground um, kind of taboo thing to talk about. 
Um, but at one point, the United Nations reported that human trafficking was a $32 billion um, industry globally, whereas um, a conversation with the FBI agent, she reported $150 billion. Human trafficking it generates an estimated $9.5 billion in annual revenue just in the United States. So we have to really get away from that idea that trafficking is something that doesn't happen here. It's something that happens in that distant land, you know, across the seas. Unfortunately, the FBI has tapped into it and they know it's thriving here in the state. Um, and then the Urban Institute reported that just eight cities, there is 40 million between 40 million and 290 million made in just eight states, eight cities, I'm sorry, not even the whole state. So again, this is about the money for a lot of people. Um, in 2017, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children responded to over 10,000 um, reports of possible sexual trafficking. According to the 2018 National Human Trafficking Hotline statistics, there was a 25% increase in human trafficking cases from 2017 to 2018. So just in 365 days, there was an increase of 25%. And there are reportedly up to 300,000 children at risk of being trafficked in the US and that number grows daily. My only concern with that stat, so I did a little extra research, um, because it comes from the FBI, the FBI took the number of child trafficking cases that they are involved in, put that in some math problem, which I don't do math, um, put it in some math problem and spit this number out. So that's only based on the number of cases that are the cases that met federal jurisdiction. So there are local, there are local, there are state and local cases sometimes that don't reach that number. And so they weren't included in the initial number that got put into this algorithm. So I'm assuming this number is way larger if we really broaden the context for um, how we calculate these numbers. The average age of entry into commercial sexual exploitation for a child victim is 13 years old. Um, I, I was really interested in this, so I did a lot more digging. I saw everything from 11 on average being somebody's first experience with commercial, exploit, commercial sexual exploitation, all the way up to 19 on average being someone's um, first entry in a commercial sexual exploitation. And so, again, that's one of those things that lets you know, you, if you're looking for what you're looking for, people can find whatever stat to go with it. However, we, we're assuming that 13 has to be about right because on average, um, when clients are referred to TCH, they are 15 years old. And so if we work in aftercare, they would have already had some experience by the time they're 15. So 13 seems right. Um, a pimp can make $150,000 to $200,000 per child each year. And the average pimp has four to six girls. Now, I know I just told you all, I'm not a fan of math, but I did do this math. This is $1.2 million, potentially, that these people are making illegally at the hands and the work and the suffering of others, particularly minors. Um, one in seven children on the street will be lured towards prostitution within the first 48 hours of leaving home. This is huge for us as an organization because 90% of the clients that have come into our residential program have a history of elopement, whether that be them running from a foster placement, running from home, um, running from hospitals, um, running from other residentials. In another survey, 48% um, of runaway and homeless youth that engaged in commercial sexual activity said they did it because they did not have a safe place to stay. So again, yes, we have trafficking that results in the exchange of money, but sometimes it doesn't always have to be money. For a lot of the runaway and homeless youth, they end up in those survival sex, sex situations. They need their basic needs met and they don't have anything to trade other than themselves. Um, the Department of Justice identified the top 20 most intense human, tra ah, human trafficking jurisdictions in the country to include Houston, El Paso, LA, Atlanta, Chicago, Charlotte, Miami, 
Las Vegas, New York, Long Island, New Orleans, D.C., Philadelphia, Phoenix, Richmond, San Diego, San Francisco, St. Louis, Seattle, and Tampa. Um, we kind of already touched on, Marcy already kind of touched on part of the reason that we are on this list. We are smack dab in the middle um, of the country, and it's really easy to crisscross the way our transportation system is set up right now, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about momentarily. Specifically in Missouri, um, in 2018, there were 178 total cases of human trafficking in Missouri. 137 of them involved sex. So there were some labor trafficking, there were some that included both sex and labor trafficking, but of 178, 137 of them in, involved sex. Um, 363 victims were identified in 2018, along with 123 traffickers and a total of 66 trafficking businesses. Um, so a lot of people are using what's pr presumed to be legit business fronts, um, things like Missouri has a lot of illicit massage parlors, unfortunately, um, and they have been cracking down on them, I feel like, since we've been involved um, with the Attorney General's Human Trafficking Task Force, we hear all the time that they shut down this massage parlor and this massage parlor, and they literally are all over the state, which is why you see this heat map um, that kind of shows the breakdown. There's no place in Missouri that's not experiencing um, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline in 2017, St. Louis ranked number seven in the number of calls per capita and 14th in the number of cases. So a call is just, you know, a call coming in, requesting some additional information. A case with the National Human Trafficking Hotline is someone calling and requiring some follow-up, trying to refer them to services or um, law enforcement and things like that. I looked at the census in 2017. I did a little bit more math. Um, according to this and the census in St. Louis City in 2017, there should have been 594 calls that came from St. Louis City. Um, and then 1,782 calls that came from St. Louis County. If we go to the number of cases, um, St. Louis City should have had 105 and St. Louis County should have had 315. I, when I first found this out, I had this conversation with a St. Louis City detective at the time, and he told me my number was off by five. So the National Human Trafficking Hotline is keeping some pretty accurate numbers. And again, we continuously got to get away from this idea that it's not here. Um, statistics again, are slightly weird, so we like to keep our own. 80% um, of the girls that come to us um, have gaps in their education from what we consider a school scar, um, a experience they had with someone at school, whether it be a peer um, or a staff member that um, kind of made them give up on school. It traumatized them during school, um, and so they weren't going, or we have those situations with the girls that have run away and been gone for an extended period of time. And so they um, are missing, they're just missing school. Um, we do quite a bit of credit recovery um, in our education program. And then like we have, we have the longest I've heard of a kiddo that we worked with missing school was two years. 65% um, experienced some kind of somatic symptom at some point in their stay with us. So somatic symptoms, things like um, chronic headaches, stomach aches, um, body aches, rashes, things like that, that don't have a medical reason, but their body is constantly in fight or flight. And it's not good for your body to constantly be in fight or flight, especially when you don't necessarily have to be. However, they've had some experiences that keep their fight or flight revved up a lot longer than most people. Um, 85 to 90 percent of our ladies were lured into exploitation through a relationship. When I say relationship, I don't even necessarily just mean romantic relationships. Relationship as in somebody they were familiar with. So stranger danger is, is a thing, yes. However, 
when it comes to trafficking, it typically is people that they feel that they know. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. 43% um, of our clients identify as LGBTQ+. 49% are African-American and 60% have been in the system within the last two years. When I say system, I mean, excuse me, involved with children's division and been in their custody and or involved with division of youth services and being um, in their custody potentially. Um, so what makes someone vulnerable? Those that are disconnected from family or school, they kind of live in isolation. Um, this increased need for money. We just have a society where money is a thing. Um, but if it's obsessive, the same thing with material need, material things, excuse me. Um, a kid's status on how cool they are, how accepted they are, is based on those material things. And um, traffickers know that. Um, history of trauma or abuse. A lot of what we see is very similar to the domestic violence um, kind of circle. Um, they continue to seek out those kinds of relationships. History of substance abuse issues. Very easy to control someone with substances if you're the source of their substance. Um, low self-esteem and a need for and a need for love and acceptance. As human beings, we have that ingrained in us. Lack of experience with healthy relationships. I can tell you it's driving me crazy to talk to these kids now and they're getting all of their relationship goals from stuff they see on TV and movies and music. And it's like, oh, my babies. Yes, they're falling in love every three minutes. Like a three week relationship is so devastating. Um, and yet they're in the next three to four week relationship in two days. Um, Unstable living situations and conditions. And again, that ends up putting them in situations for survival sex. They need their basic needs met. Did I want to prostitute my body away to strange men? She said, no, I wanted to be loved by someone. I wanted a male in my life to show me care. And this is how I thought I had to do it. This is from a 14 year old victim in South Dakota. I like to use this quote because it kind of touches on several of the things we just talked about, um, what makes them vulnerable. She wanted connection so bad that it was okay. And it was also okay to be trafficked and exploited by this individual because she did not have an understanding of what a healthy relationship is. This is a 14 year old victim and it's in South Dakota. So it really does not matter if there are booming metropolises in these states, it literally is everywhere. If we were to go back and look at that heat map, um, there's not a single state. It's in Alaska and Hawaii as well. So it is here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things of, when we were talking about those young kids um, doing it. So there's a myth that, um, you know, you have just, you know, poor kids or um, people of color because of the disparity in, um, in, in the things that they go through, that those are the ones are, you know, they have the fathers out of the home. Um, this was meant that those risk factors are the way um, have most of the kids um, vulnerable to trafficking. While there are definitely risk factors. Um, that, that thing about that self-esteem and that love is one of the biggest things that, um, that gets kids pulled. Um, we had a young lady um, who, actually we've had several young ladies who have both parents in the picture. Um, they have you know, a loving um, church environment. They had friends and things, but it was that man that showed them um, that showed them that attention or that sense of belonging. And um, unfortunately, since we're talking about transportation, um, one of the ways they were recruited because there's, uh, uh, the society is more comfortable with, um, with LGBTQ and those relationships, you, you still, you have women who are now um, traffic, uh, trafficking young people. Um, there's a, um, 
on the Metro Link, we're hearing that um, there's a uh, there's a pimp, a female pimp, and they call her Mama, um, who sends um, they she has her way and she sends them on the Metro Link, specifically using just the Metro Link send her girls to whatever stop till they pick them up. Um, Hand, if you guys know the Hanley Metrolink station, that is a huge stop for trafficking. Um, we were working with um, some of the, uh, the trafficking uh, detectives um, in the city. That was one of the places that they would uh, connect with St. Louis County or it's like, you know, hey, my girl is headed up to um, the Metro, the Hamley Metro link, um, you know, can you intercept her for it so that we can get her back? Um, so that, you know, that Metro link using that transportation and, so, and because St. Louis actually has a really good transportation system, you can um, get to anywhere you want to by, you know, getting, uh, getting a transfer to get on this bus and then jumping on the Metro link. You can park to ride um, that and it is, and it, it's so easy to do it that is one of the ways that um, they're missing kids. And all you need, I think the bus fare is what, $3 now? You, you, don't, you don't need very much to be able to, to get a ride, so. And that, that made me think of something, like I normally bring that up a lot sooner. Um, you would never know a victim necessarily just by looking at them. It's not just, female victims. There are male victims. There are adult male victims. Um, and the same thing with the traffickers. You would not necessarily know a trafficker if you saw them. Um, man, woman, no specific race, um, anything like that. And the same thing with the buyers. You would never necessarily know a buyer. There are men and women buying also. Um, and we tend to always say girls because we work predominantly with girls. Um, However, we have a couple, encountered a couple of boys and transgender youth as well. Um, the places where they're starting to recruit them from, um, schools, hallways, the court buildings, foster homes, bus stations that we mentioned, um, homeless shelters, restaurants, bars, parks, playgrounds, and malls. Excuse me. The biggest thing that we, <laughs> we always kind of laugh about it. We have people call us all the time. Hey, I saw this white van. What should I do? They trafficking kids at Schnooks. And did, I'm, the white van. My goodness. I'm sorry, people. There are vans that are white, and we can't do anything about it. Um, Sharita likes to joke. Um, Sharita likes to joke specifically about, you know, these white vans. And there are, you know, murderers and kidnappers and things like that. They're not necessarily traffickers. Every Every kind of psychopath has their own use for these vans um but uh, it, it just becomes a little overwhelming because when we start to teach those that are around us about trafficking you start to see it everywhere you're kind of hyper vigilant um and sometimes that's not necessarily what it is but um something that they're doing and the way that they're able to get into these foster homes schools um, and court buildings, because now everything is locked down. There's no just walking into a school anymore. Um, so they're using what they consider less threatening people, whether that be um, another kid um, or a woman, because we have this idea that there's the creepy old guy is the one that's recruiting and doing the trafficking and things like that. Um, but in order to recruit, you need to kind of break that barrier and start building relationship. And so they're sending in less threatening kind of people. Um, ways that they're recruiting through social media and the internet, it's literally the World Wide Web. It's connecting people that would never have connection before. Um, and it's a lot easier now because everybody has one of these. Um, there's also these classified ads um, looking for models, actresses, and promising good jobs. Um, we've had quite a few kiddos not realize that these modeling gigs are just ploys to kind of, they're kind of an audition to, to see them naked and things like that and see how far they can push them. Um, we have things like the whole Me Too movement that come out of things like this. Um, 
Um, how do children fall into the lifestyle? We've talked about quite a few of these already. Um, we do have those individuals that are trafficked into the country, in and out of the country, like the taken situations, um, as well as abducted. Um, we have quite a few um, people that are selling their family. Um, familial trafficking is pretty big in Missouri, unfortunately. We talked about the runaway or throwaway kids, as well as the internet and survival sex. But now we're really going to get into this idea of the boyfriend Romeo or finesse pimp. Um, they have what we call this grooming or courting period. I like to call it like building this kid up and putting them on a pedestal, making this kiddo believe they are the most important thing in their life. Um, they target minors because it's believed that they're vulnerable. They're young, they're naive. Um, they manipulate them with false love and false affection. That's typically what's missing, which is what Sharita mentioned. Even if everything else is good on paper, um, there's still some kind of disconnect when it comes to feeling affection. And so they seek it out and these traffickers know. And so they give them gifts and compliments, physical and sexual intimacy, elaborate promises of a better life, fast money and future luxuries. How do they do it? I find whatever hole she has and I put myself in it. If she needs a daddy, I become her daddy. If she wants a boyfriend, I become a boyfriend. If she needs shoes, I buy her shoes. This is from a former pimp. I love to use this because we have a society that says kids need to come to us. This right here tells us we need to go to them because somebody is looking for the thing that's missing in their life to become that and, and flip that and exploit them use it with that. So after they've built them up on this pedestal with this grooming period, you have this seasoning or breaking where they pull that rug from underneath that pedestal or knock that pedestal out from underneath that kid. Um, it's all about breaking them down from like a healthy understanding of sexual boundaries to this idea that sex is just something that you do. It's very mechanical. There's nothing to it. Um, pimps, on, pimps have been telling their process which is how we know about all of this. It works and it's been working forever. Um, it's all about gaining complete control over someone's individuality. This is one of the ways that they are doing that. Um, branding, just as if you would brand an animal to show ownership. But I think this is, well, this is twofold because a person that gets branded can understand what the branding is as opposed to an animal understanding what the branding is. So not only is it showing everybody in the underworld that this person belongs to somebody, it's a reminder to that individual that I also belong to somebody. Other means of seasoning or breaking, um, physical beatings, burnings, sexual assault, confinement. Confinement was one of those things I just didn't think about, but it makes sense. They use it in the prison system to break spirits and things like that. So um, withholding food or water, we can go three minutes without air, three days without water, supposedly three weeks without food on average. Um, this we have encountered ourselves. It was a very hard thing for me personally to, to, to get a hold of. Um, when we were working with one young lady in particular, like food was a trigger for her because it was used as a means to um, control her. And so when she got to us, food got her extremely upset sometimes. Um, emotional abuse, um, threats, threats are huge. Um, a lot of those kids that we have worked with have explained that just the thought that oh, I've been talking to this person and they know about me. They know where I go to school. They know where my parents live. They know where I attend church. Um, just threats of being able to do something to anything that they hold dear is huge. Creating dependencies, teaching them how to walk, talk, what to wear, when to eat, what to, when to sleep, all of those kinds of things, as well as with substances. We've had um, some young ladies that weren't necessarily hardcore drug users or anything like that. However, their traffickers use that as a form of control, being their source, um, moving them to a new location where they don't know anyone, taking their identification, and then sexual conditioning. 
you've been exposed to it. Um, but the question is, did you know? In pop culture, we have these three songs. We're not going to necessarily get a chance to go through them, but um, I'd like to show that there were three different genres of music and three different time periods. We have a song from the 70s, an R&B song from the 70s that mentioned it, um, Olivia Lost and Turned Out. Some of those lyrics are, Olivia the slave got distracted on her way to grandma's house. A wolf in sheep's clothing came, um, blew her mind and changed her ways. And now she's turned out, lost and turned out. Um, we have Reba's um, version of Fancy. That speaks to familial trafficking. That was one of those songs where a lot of people knew, but they never really stopped to think about what was being said. Um, and then we have some hip hop from 2012 from Kendrick Lamar. He speaks specifically about um, how those that are supposed to help and intervene as in law enforcement and judges and things like that are also sometimes the buyers um, and not helping them get out of their situations. This was kind of the big like whammy, the big slap in the face when it comes to trafficking being kind of made cool or brushed over by um, popular culture. With in 2005, um, three a, a hip hop group, Three Six Mafia, they won best original song at the Academy Awards for "It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp" from the movie Hustle and Flow, which. I definitely, in 2005, I knew nothing about this. When I saw Hustle and Flow, it, it was just another movie. And now I have to watch it, if I do watch it, with a different lens. Of course, now I'm the wet blanket that's like, we can watch this, but now we're going to have a conversation about it. Um, which doesn't necessarily always go over all that well with my friends. Um, but what are you looking for? What red flags are you specifically looking for? If you were to interact with somebody or attempt to interact with them and they're not allowed to speak for themselves, there's kind of this mouthpiece over here that's answering everything. Um, if they appear helpless, shamed and or nervous, um, they're kind of avoiding eye contact and looking down and shifting and things like that. Um, you also have to understand some cultures are different when it comes to eye contact and things like that. Um, but for the most part, you know, here, in the States, we look each other in the eyes when we're speaking and things like that. Um, if you see signs of physical abuse, those are always red flags. Things like bruises, black eyes, burns, cuts, broken bones and teeth. Um, the hospitals have been really great with notifying authorities about those, what they call frequent flyers that are constantly coming in with some kind of ailment. Um, and they're just coming in too frequently with the same kind of thing. Um, if all of a sudden a young person has a lot of stuff, you know, that they can't afford a lot of stuff that, you know, is expensive. Um, you couldn't pay for lunch last week. And yet this week you have the latest iPhone or the newest Jordans and things like that. Um, the extravagant appearances, um, kids that are just dressed inappropriately for their age or for the weather specifically, um, grooming behaviors. I consider grooming behaviors, things like, um, kind of leaving their previous life behind because they now have contact and connection with some person. Everything that mattered to them before, it doesn't matter at all. And all they want to talk about is this one person and how great they are and all those kinds of things. Um, addictions to drugs or alcohol or new tattoos. Um, I do have a couple of tattoos. Um, and so it's always really interesting to understand like brand, how branding is used and things like that. Um, I have also been researching that and understanding that there are actually some um, tattoo parlors that are covering up those kinds of branding tattoos for free. Um, so if you suspect trafficking, what are you doing? Please do not approach them. Um, you put you are putting yourself in danger and potentially putting them in more danger however you can call the national human trafficking hotline and or text them um this is great information i can make sure to put this in the chat as well excuse me um other ways that you can report specifically in missouri as well as federally um there's the missouri information analyst system or the MIAC excuse me, you can go online and submit a report there. Um, the Missouri State Highway Patrol, they have an app 
it's good for both Apple and Android products. And um, you can put that, your tip there, um, as well as the CSEND app. Um, the idea that if you see something strange, you say something. I really like to use those, especially with the youth that we talk to when I do this presentation, because again, nobody does, nobody does not have a phone. Everybody has a phone. <laughs> Um, how you can help volunteer your time or of your resources by joining our Quilt Square Society or just bring awareness, host trainings and presentations, ask us to come out, um, learn more about the issue, do your research and encourage others to do the same. Um, write a letter to your legislators, letting them know, hey, I learned some stuff about trafficking here in Missouri and it concerns me. What are you doing about it? Um, and then speak out against insensitive conversations and jokes. Again, I've kind of become the wet blanket and I'm okay with that. <laughs> if you decide to do, um, if you decide to do some research of your own, these are some great ways that we suggest that you do that. There are a couple books here. Renting Lacey. Renting Lacey is a very easy read. Um, that's actually a really good book for kids to read um, to get an understanding of trafficking. So like, maybe fifth grade-ish to maybe eighth grade. That's a really good read for them. Um, the Slave Across the Street, Girls Like Us and the White Umbrella. If you are a visual learner, um, we have Law and Order Special Victims Unit. There is an episode called Undercover Mother that shows kind of the hierarchy and the behind the scenes of the trafficking very well. Um, then we have um, I Am Jane Doe, which is a documentary. It was on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's still there. Um, but that was very specific about how youth were sold for sex on websites, things like um, back, back pay mm -hmm. and um, Craigslist. Craigslist, things like that. Um, and one of those young ladies that is in that documentary is from the Ferguson area. And so again, it's, he, it's here, there's no getting away from it. Um, and then we have trust, where we see how the entire family is impacted by the sexual exploitation of one of its members. Um, I don't know if we have time for this, but I will make sure to send it so you all can see it a little later. I think it just, it's a poem and I think it just wraps up all of the stats and things that we've talked about very well. And it just, it, it's not numbers. It's somebody's personal story and their personal understanding, which sometimes just hits harder. Um, and so I will make sure that you all get that, but that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you very much to both Jessica and Sharita for all of this wealth of information on what human trafficking is and how it's impacting the communities in Missouri. At this point, we wanna offer some time for questions for our panelists. If there's any questions, please put them in the chat box or the Q&A. I did have a question, Jessica and Sharita, for both of you. I mean, the Missouri hotspot map that you put up, Jessica, most of the most if not all and i would argue that probably all of those areas are covered by one of our missouri transit providers so um you covered it a little bit in the end um about what signs to be looking for but transit providers our operators are in these communities day in and day out serving these communities on the buses or on i mean you referenced the north hanley metrolink station and metrolink and we have a significant number of Metro Public Safety who are joining us for this conversation today. Are there any signs that they should be looking for for potentially um, someone that's trying to recruit individuals or mm. victims themselves that might not have been in that list that someone would pick up if they saw the individual on a regular basis, let's say, a tell? Absolutely. So um, the, the key thing is when you said on a regular basis, if you're seeing someone hang around and not riding um, or kind of uh, or riding and never getting off, you're probably looking at a recruiter or someone who's, um, you know, they, they're there and they're making it um, their career to ride the transit. <laughs> you're, you're probably doing it. Um, 
if you're seeing a lot of what you're seeing, especially with kids, the younger kids with the older people that don't, that aren't familiar people uh, um, to them, like they, they aren't family. So, um, or even if they are family, you're seeing inappropriate touching or <clears throat> listening to the conversations, you'll see, you know, um, hard looks from the, the adult that, towards that child. From the child, you may also see um, just eyes of distress. So our our um, nonverbal language is about 80% of our communication. So watching eyes, um, looking at postures, um, looking at um, whether their, their clothes are inappropriate for their age. Um, so even though, I don't know, shorts are getting shorter, might as well those are my opinions, I'll keep them, but <laughs> shorts are getting shorter. However, if you're seeing a 12-year-old wearing, um, um, dressing very adult, um, a lot of makeup, those are red, red flags. So it's either someone who's being inappropriate and on their way into trouble or they're made to be dressed that way. Either way, you have a troubled youth. You have um, looking, looking at where, where they're stopping at, um, addressing, um, if you're seeing, um, especially at the buses, when they stop, are you seeing frequenting, um, frequenting in and out of a particular house? Um, like when the buses go through the neighborhoods. I know in the city, a lot of times, the city of St. Louis, you know, it goes, especially on like the north side, it goes up and down some of the, the side, the streets. So you may, um, you may see a particular house that has a lot of people in it. So we're watching for trap houses. So the, the, your drivers, your, um, your monitors could be, you know, alerting the police like, Hey, I'm seeing a lot of activity at this house. There's, um, you know, <clears throat> there's a, a guy who's consistently on the bus every day. He always has a different girl or boy with him. Um, Transgender youth, that transgender male to female is a very high victim um, uh, victim rate. So you're watching if you're seeing um, a lot of transgender youth um, with um, with older people also, or um, you'll you'll see they'll always look distressed. Most of the kids always look distressed in some sort of way because though they may sometimes enjoy the benefits of the lifestyle where they don't have to um <clears throat> they don't have to listen to an adult or they don't have a curfew or they get their hair and nails done when they're on their way to uh, to turn a trick of whatever sort it's not pleasurable for them um even when they you know they like the the rest of the party style of the lifestyle they don't like um having to turn tricks so um, just watching, watching that body language is huge in those situations. Um, if you're, and even if, um, I think the Metrolink um, stops are like, um, they even stop in front of some of the hotels like on Natural Bridge, um, or sorry, uh, the Bi-State does. Is it Bi-State? Sorry, it's Metro now. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so used to be in Bi-State all those years ago. But they also have, you know, if they're checking into hotels, you see them walking to hotels with no luggage. That's a that's a, a, another good sign. So they may just have like, a, you know, the book bag purses, but they may have just their change of clothes, some condoms and things, and, you know, a cell phone or something, but they don't have any real luggage. Those are also big signs of, of something happening. Um, seeing people mismatch. Um, so maybe you'll see a business person with a kid who's dressed, um, who's dressed inappropriately. So just paying attention to something, if you, something that just looks odd, it's okay to, to send an alert. They would, they would rather have over reporting than none at all. I think okay. something okay. else to look for is, um, when there are big events, when there's games, especially downtown, um, because traffickers will take their um, workers to their to the client base. It's more likely that you'll finally get somebody that says, yes, I want to buy or whatever, 
um, in larger groups of people and it goes a little, it's a little easier to go undetected in a large group of people. So specifically um, when it comes to the Metrolink and or buses um, downtown specifically during like um, on game days or days where there are huge events going on um, in whatever area, including Kansas City, like I keep saying St. Louis because that's my reference, but um, even in, even across the state. Thank you so much for that additional information. So I, I did want to piggyback on that a little bit. So St. Louis is one of our more urban areas in the state. So we have a lot of providers in the rural areas. Are there any additional signs that our rural operators should be looking for? Or are all the same? I think I would say all the same. Um, okay. <clears throat> it looks a little differently in the rural areas, um, and there's not as much um, research that's happening because if it's um, in most of the rural areas, it, it's you don't have the regular buses that you would have in St. Louis and Kansas City, so <clears throat> they may have cars. So you, it still goes a lot really undetected. But um, like looking, you're looking at kids who may be malnourished or only eating fast food, um, kids who, what I have experienced, um, are they, they are less um, pr um, primped, primped and so they're not changing clothes as much. Um, so they may look a little, um, they may look a little dirtier or um, maybe strung out on drugs. So down in our, like our rural areas where we have like the meth capitals and you know, so um, like places like in Springfield or Poplar Bluff, you're going to see more kids addicted to drugs than you may. Uh, so maybe a little bit more strung out than you may see in um, in St. Louis area. I think in the rural areas, it's about kind of also keeping your eyes on truck stops. Um, a lot of it is happening there. Um, I have a friend who just started driving a truck and I was like, hey, this is what you're looking for. This is who you call if you see stuff. <laughs> um, and so, cause we've known people where there, it's the same car that's coming to the truck stop to sit all day. And it's several different people getting out of that car and they keep coming in to check with this car, but they going up to individual trucks and, you know, or just hanging around the truck stop all day you know, even inside trying to get people's attention and things like that. Um, that would probably be the easiest way to see it in a more rural area. Okay, thank you. So really, it's about awareness and what's happening around you. And when you start to see trends, that's really important to be paying attention. So uh, ladies, this has been just fantastic. We have had numerous requests throughout your entire presentation of how can they get the slide deck. So if I believe you're okay with that, we'll make it available on the Missouri Public Transit Association website, as well as the resources that people can contact. If they are seeing something, we will make that very clear, very bold on the website, as well as information about the covering house and the work that you're doing and a link to that. So if anyone is interested in additional um, opportunities to work with you or presentations. Um, I think it would be fabulous if we could get the information out about the covering house across the state of Missouri, not just in the St. Louis area. So we will be putting that out on our website. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. I think that the information is very pertinent and timely, and I can't thank you enough for joining us. And thank you to Marcy and East West Gateway for um, helping us put this conversation together. And thank you again to both of you for this really important topic and bringing it to the forefront for our transit providers in the state of Missouri. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you everyone. And we will get this up as quickly as possible on the website and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Valerie, are we?